Good afternoon, all. Welcome to August Network Tech Talk. It is so great seeing everyone this afternoon. For those of you who have not attended in the past, Central Maine Network Tech Talk is a monthly event where founders and leaders share advice on how they overcome challenges, capitalize on their target market, and develop their product, providing you with actionable insight for your own products and processes. For more information, you can find us on Facebook or online at centralmaine.org under our Tech Night tab. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this afternoon's conversation. This free event is presented by Central Maine Growth Council and is sponsored by CGI, Thomas College's Harold Alphonse Institute for Business Innovation, Valley Beverage, and Bricks Coworking and Innovation Space. In addition, I'd like to say hello to folks watching remotely at home or from their office. This tech talk is being streamed live and will be available for later viewing on our YouTube channel. This afternoon's August Tech Talk is with Gray Optics, shaping the future of biomedical and industrial optics with Dan Gray, founder and principal optical engineer of Gray Optics. In this network Tech Talk, Dan will discuss how Gray Optics is advancing imaging technologies and optical systems for biomedical, life science, and industrial applications with a full suite of capabilities in optical, mechanical, electronics integration, and machine vision. For those who are not familiar with Gray Optics, Gray Optics helps clients shape the future of biomedical and industrial markets, leveraging their team's experience to define innovative strategies, develop novel imaging technologies, and build the right products for your application. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Dan Gray. Dan, thank you for joining us. Hi, Sabrina. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Okay. Is that coming up right for everybody? Looks great. Great. Well, thanks again, Sabrina. Um, it's been great to get to know the Central Maine Growth Council uh, and, and also uh, work with you, Sabrina, on, on coordinating this talk. I've been very impressed with uh, the organization and everything that, uh, that you're doing. So it's very exciting to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so here's my email if you'd like to get in touch, uh, as well as our website, and I'll have this at the final slide as well. Um, so I was excited to put this talk together, Sabrina recommended that that we try to do it in a way that uh, that's kind of aligned to the how I built this series on, on NPR, which I love, I love listening to, and one of my sources of motivation is starting the business. So it's not an interview, but we'll try to keep it kind of free flowing. And, and as uh, Sabrina said, I'll take questions um, as they come up. Um, so please go for it. Um, very good. So Dan Gray, uh, founder and president of Gray Optics. Uh, Gray Optics was founded in 2017. We're based in Portland, Maine. And uh, as Sabrina introduced, our, our tagline is that we accelerate new product development for biomedical and industrial optics. And hopefully through this talk, you'll understand um, what we mean by biomedical and industrial and more specifically about what we do. Um, so here's the team. Um, this is a, a recent photo where we had uh, all of our staff together in our office. Uh, we have quite a few uh, staff that work remotely and we, they came out to Portland uh, for the Gray Optics uh, 2021 Summit. And we grabbed this nice photo of everybody. Um, we have a team of 15 full-time in addition uh, to several contractors that work remotely. Um, our mission, uh, Gray Optics exists to change and improve, save lives through development of new optical uh, products for the medical, life science, and industrial markets. Furthermore, we're dedicated to building a company with a collaborative culture where people are fulfilled by their work. So that's our mission. Um, but you're wondering, what, what do we really do? And here I'll try to explain that. Um, our business model is design and manufacturing services from a B2B context. So we work with other businesses to solve uh, product development and technology challenges, ultimately, ideally ending up in new products that enter the market to achieve you know, the mission that we've stated there. Um, so more specifically, the work that our team does is designing, assembling, and testing optical products in those markets that we work in. And here's some pictures of, of the types of things that we're working on. Um, these are devices that have optics, mechanics, electronics, software, um, uh, all within them. Uh, through those collaborative partnerships with our customers, um, we, we aim to solve their complex problems and accelerate um, uh, product development cycles. Uh, more about our company and culture. Um, this is just as important as the tech work that we do to foster a positive company culture. Uh, this year, we put in a, an objective and key results process, OKRs, to really align 
uh, everything that everyone's doing in the company to what's most important uh, in order to uh, sustain our, our growth and, and strategy. Um, this involves hiring the best people, training them, empowering them to do their best, and continually striving to be a great place to work for. Um, some of our LinkedIn um, promotions have these taglines about people are our greatest strength, and, 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 and that's really how we operate. Um, core values, um, customer focus. The customers are at the center of everything we do. The next one is, is a fun one. This is a fire in the belly. And uh, this has a story behind it. Um, our senior leadership team uh, at a retreat this year was really working on these core values, trying to name them something that was meaningful to us. And we were talking about uh, motivated, passionate, um, driven, grit. And we're like, there's something there. Um, and our, our finance director, Tony Hessert said, I call that fire in the belly. And so that's how fire in the belly got on this core value list. And that's what it means to us. Uh, thirdly, all in engagement. And this has a special meaning for us as well. Um, this refers to a book that was really uh, fundamental in, in, in sort of my, my approach to uh, starting and growing a business. It's called All In. Um, and the tagline of the book is how managers, um, how, be how the best managers create a culture of belief and drive big results by Adrian Gostick and Chester Elton. And one of the fun things that we do at Gray Optics is that every new employee gets a copy of the book and they have about three months to read it. And they do a, a really cool um, report out on what they took away from the book. And that's part of our kind of company ritual. And it's become a really fun way to get to know people and introduce them to the company. And so this is a, what the book looks like. Highly recommend it. So I'll, I'll pause there. Are there any questions that came out of that first section before I get into a little bit more about you know, my personal story? But should I keep going, Sabrina? OK, I'll keep going. Um, so my story, and, and as best as I can do from a how I built this perspective. Um, so uh, I got my, my bachelor's, master's, and PhD at the University of Rochester. Um, and I finished uh, my PhD in 2007. Um, and having grown up in a household where both parents uh, operated their own, their own businesses, uh, entrepreneurship was something that I, I always aspired to do. Um, and even in, in graduate school, I had an opportunity to uh, start a company. And uh, that was one of the options that I had coming out of graduate school is to, to start a company with my, uh, my PhD advisor. Uh, instead of that, I decided to work at a more established company uh, called Optos. Optos was, in, was based in the United Kingdom. So it was a fun opportunity to, to move abroad and live there um, and, and really learn uh, what a company uh, is all about. Um, and you know, I think uh, not having worked in, in a company in graduate school, I had different ideas of what it might be like, but this was a great experience to, to really, really see what it was all about. Um, and I stayed there for, for about three years, and then I moved back to the United States uh, to work at General Electric. And uh, at General Electric, um, my role was um, more of a, an early stage uh, research type of job. And I, I did that for a number of years and did some exciting work in different applications of optics, uh, medical optics, life science, and industrial, as it turns out. Um, and I found that my personal motivations are, are really more around the later stages of product development and launch into the market versus research. Um, and I further uh, kind of built my interests in eventually uh, starting a company. Uh, this is also a time when I started my family. And so as, as anyone uh, within that situation, we'll know um, the two aren't really necessarily compatible in a lot of ways because of the constraints and risks that go along with uh, starting a company. So uh, I, I uh, then decided to move uh, up to Portland, Maine to work at Lighthouse Imaging, which is another company in our industry who does great work as well. Uh, and, and there I learned more about um, a small business and the consulting model and uh, decided in 2017 that, that now was the right time to start the, biz the business. Um, I, I learned many things along the way and uh, it was good timing with my family. And uh, those factors led me to start Gray Optics uh, originally in, in the town that I live in in Cumberland and now in Portland, Maine. Um, and the area and the region is a, a great, great place for uh, technologies that we work in. 
So Gray Optics is now in our, our fourth year and uh, it's been an exciting journey. Okay, I'm just gonna do a check in. Any questions before I move to the next slide? Dan, do you mind touching on kind of a little bit uh, fleshing out your origin story there and kind of yeah. your, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the the fun and the the joys, but the pain of that kind of initial startup phase, probably being in the valley of death there in so far <laughs> as being pre-revenue. And um, how did you navigate those waters? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, the, our business model uh, started as a consulting model uh, and still and still is in a lot of ways. It's more kind of like a business develop, uh, 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 product development services is the way we describe it now. But originally it was a consulting model. And so unlike um, a, a, a new tech company that's taking extraordinary risk, like a lot of our customers do, they have a, like a great new idea and um, there's a lot of capital needed to kind of just even see if the idea is, is viable. Um, uh, we, we, I, I started essentially um, providing services that I'm expert at and have the experience at. And what was really neat about that is um, uh, I, got, I got feedback about the, the services that I was providing immediately through uh, the sort of value that the customers got in the paid services. And so um, you hear a lot about, uh, uh, you know, product market fit. Well, you know, finding out if companies Going, or somebody's going to pay you for what you're offering is, is really the way to do that. And so that feedback happened right from the beginning. And it was really a great signal to kind of figure out uh, which direction to head. And um, I didn't have a business plan or a business model. This is really very organic and there are pros and cons to that approach. Um, the, the one pro was that uh, I didn't fail at anything because I hadn't, I hadn't really written it down exactly what I was trying to do. I was exploring the market and trying to find out what the opportunities were, which enabled me to sort of head down a path that was really clear. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, awesome. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, why Maine? Well, I think the sign here says it all, um, the way life should be and open for business. And that's, that's really kind of the combo for me. Um, we're a member of the Biosciences Association of Maine, and a um, number of great companies uh, listed there. Um, there, there are over 7,000 jobs in, in the biosciences industry in Maine across more than 426 companies. Um, and Maine happens to have a nice, unique concentration of companies doing pharmaceutical, research, medical, biosciences work, and of course, the quality of life. Um, I think that's a real draw for, for me personally and a lot of our team and, and, uh, and also a great uh, you know, family environment, all the different um, outdoor pursuits and, and cultural uh, outlets that we have for us here. Um, and how do we do it uh, from a growth perspective? Um, hiring the best people building your dream job. So these things really align with, with our approach uh, to our culture and our team. And um, to really solidify that, last year I hired uh, Josh Otto, who's our Director of Talent and Organizational Development. So for a company of 15, it's not typical to have a job like this, but this really, um, this really shows um, how we're prioritizing, um, you know, building that culture and getting getting the right people here, and aligning uh, at a candidate skills and experience and aspirations to value at Gray Optics. And when those two things are aligned, that's really the sweet spot uh, in a in a work engagement. So, company strategy. Um, we view the company as, as having a scale and longevity. Uh, you know, unlike uh, tech, other tech startups, we don't have a specific exit plan. Uh, we're looking to build uh, a long-term brand and business known for the work that we do. Um, and to do that, we're aligning our customer partnerships with our strategic growth arc. And what this means is uh, the graphic here shows kind of where we started as a design partner, where we are now as a prototype and assembly partner, and ultimately uh, offering precision assemblies, uh, manufacturing services. And so our strategy to do this is find customers that, uh, that we can bring along their journey in product development and thus uh, grow our capabilities. We consider ourselves as influencers in, in the optical technology space, uh, as well as being experts in the markets we work in, um, having uh, 
all of our technical team has experience in, in these markets, the medical life science and industrial markets. And so we're able to leverage those experiences when we work with customers to accelerate their product development time. All right, uh, any questions before I go further here? Still good. Great. Um, so more about the team. Uh, we have an experienced team of engineers and project managers uh, with experience uh, building, scaling businesses, and regulated markets, and capital equipment. Most of our employees have an advanced degree, PhD, master's, or bachelor's. Our technical staff uh, covers all these disciplines, uh, optics, mechanics, software development, electronics, uh, system design, process automation, and everything is really organized through our project management team. Uh, and we'll get into more of those details about how we do that. Um, as I said before, this, our staff has experience in the, in the markets and applications that we work in, uh, the medical devices, and other complex optical systems and metrology tools. Dan, um, is there a, oh, yeah. I didn't mean to step on you there. No, no, just, no, no just go for it. Curious, within uh, medical devices, of course, a huge space um, and major players from Metronic to beyond. Um, and here we are in Maine, we, you know, we have some veter veterinarian type experience. Is there um, a space within uh, medical devices or robotic uh, types of robotic surgeries you guys um, have core alignment with? Yeah, actually, that, that's going to be covered on the next slide, so I'll go right into that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, when we talk about medical life science and industrial, um, there's really uh, kind of a, a dividing line between um, uh, devices that are, that are regulated uh, or devices that are used on, say, live people versus um, samples. Um, and so <clears throat> think of, um, as everyone's now familiar with, PCR devices are measuring samples, and, and in a lot of cases, those are regulated and have to be developed through, a, through a, a, an FDA uh, process, an ISO process, um, and as well as medical devices. On the industrial side, um, there aren't as, there aren't, uh, as many uh, regulations that need to be followed. Um, most companies are ISO 9001 that would be operating in this space. But um, so that at a high level, that's how we differentiate the, the three different markets. And then more specifically, um, a lot of exciting work in, in all three. In the medical space, we really specialize in systems that are uh, uh, used in uh, surgical robots or other endoscopy applications, uh, fluorescence imaging. And so we'll get into a case study about that one. That's, that's really a, a way of augmenting a surgeon's eyes beyond what they can see normally. Um, ophthalmology, so this is anything to do with the eye. That happens to be my personal technical background and uh, developing equipment for measuring, for, for taking pictures of the back of the eye, uh, neurology, dental. <clears throat> um, life sciences would include, uh, as, as I mentioned, PCR you know, testing equipment, uh, other types of compact microscopes, uh, flow systems, uh, and fluorescence microscopy, which we'll get into a case study on as well. And then industrial, um, it's a bit more varied, um, uh, high power laser applications, uh, industrial inspection, uh, hyperspectral imaging. So again, that, that one refers to essentially providing imagery beyond what the eye can see for different applications, 3D printing, those kind of things. So any questions on, on the slide? I'll, I'll jump in real quick, Dan. Um, really incredible to see how the company has, you know, changed and shifted in such a short period of time. If you could kind of sum up the direction of how the company has gone, you know, from the beginning in terms of the scope of services that you offered, you know, what are some of the newer services that you're really excited to be able to offer to, you know, consumers and healthcare and things of that nature? Yeah, I, I think it really, it really kind of comes back to this arc here. And, um, to kind of go into more detail, um, designing, and, and actually I'll, I'll go through some case studies, but designing means uh, developing, you know, a model on a computer and maybe some drawings, and then that's what we're sending to our customer. <clears throat> Prototyping would be to, to take those, you know, drawings and, and, and designs and actually build something for the first time, test it, and then um, uh, kind of uh, consolidate all the learning from that prototype 
into an updated uh, requirements document for the product, et cetera. And then precision assembly and manufacturing would be um, producing goods that are sold to the end customer um, on, a, on a contract manufacturing basis or otherwise. So where we're, where we're heading is kind of between the prototype assembly and, and precision and manufacturing and assembly. Um, so there's quite a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure build out that's needed to go from, from here to here. Uh, the prototype assembly to precision assembly. <clears throat> um, so that's that's one area. Another area is uh, just the all the all the different um, technology applications. We continue to see a lot of work in surgical robot um, uh, neurology is another uh, one that's up and coming. Uh, still quite a lot of interest in AR and VR. Uh, this was exciting, kind of hot application about five years ago and. Um, there's a lot of consumer interest and that's played out, but we continue to see this in the medical space, taking AR glasses technology um, and applying them in the, in the different medical or life, life science markets. So yeah, a lot of interesting stuff. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so a little bit more about, about how Gray Optics supports uh, medical device development in our, in our process. Um, ISO 1345 is, a, is an international standard that, that determines how a medical device needs to be designed and developed and, and produced. Um, how we work with customers in this space is, is kind of uh, depicted within this blue box here. Um, there's a, there's a, a standard sequence and process of developing a new product um, in any product, but this is really um, aimed at medical devices where the, the user need or the problem needs to be well understood. Uh, and then you go through a series of design, um, building and testing phases. And uh, finally ending up with a medical device. And um, these stages need to be done in order to make sure that um, the right product was developed for the right problem or application. And how Gray Optics works with customers in this space is sort of within the inner loop. So we uh, meet with the customer and learn what the problem is. Uh, they may have existing technology that's that's been prototyped. Um, we develop um, design inputs, which refers to how are we going to um, how is the device going to function to meet this problem or user need. Then we go through design process, uh, building and testing prototypes. And then finally, we have a finished product design along with uh, what's called verification um, prototypes or units. And those are used to confirm that what was what came out of the design process meets um, the functional requirements. And that's the loop that we work within. And then our customer, who's ultimately selling the medical device, takes um, either the, the full device or the module that, that we've developed turns it into the finished product and does this customer validation process. So there's a, an outer loop that the customer is responsible for. So now I'm going to go into some case studies and I'll, I'll pause there if there are any questions before I get into that. Um, so here are some real examples of work that we've done. Um, this is a case study in the surgical vision space. Uh, it's a startup company, and their mission and goal is to uh, prevent medical errors by enhancing surgeons' vision beyond what they can see. And so uh, if you think of a surgical camera looking inside the body, uh, most cameras will have a kind of a color image, um, and that's kind of akin to the surgeon being inside the person, so they see the colors as they would normally be. Um, this technology is meant to augment what, what the surgeon can see. And there's, um, they approximate 400,000 deaths that may be preventable with this technology. And so the work that we did was related to um, an optical attachment that went between a laparoscope, which is um, shown uh, down here. I'm not sure if you can see the mouse, but uh, Sabrina, do you see the mouse when I, when I move it over here? Yes. Okay, great. So this is this is a, a laparoscope. So that's what is typically used within um, a, an operating room. And then there's a camera that goes on the back end. <clears throat> this company's technology goes in between and provides imagery like what's shown up here. And um, one of the one of the things that it shows is where blood is flowing. And so 
that's really important during certain procedures um, to make sure that they're operating in the right place and doing the right thing. So uh, the work that Gray Optics did was to design the lenses and the mechanics that are within this, this device and the customer has been successful in getting it FDA cleared and launching it on the market. Any questions on that one? Dan, you referenced that you put this uh, laboroscope or the prototype within four months. That seems like a very quick uh, project timeline there. Is that the typical timeline where you can turn around a, a, a prototype of such sophistication? Yeah, it is, it is fast and uh, there's a lot of variables. Uh, the, the sort of global supply chain is a factor right now with, with things not being you know, normal. Um, lead times that they used to be. But uh, yeah, we if things are lined up right, we're able to do design and get prototype optics uh, with, within that timeline. And so some of the, I'll go into some of the sort of common pitfalls that actually could make that a lot longer. But again, when things are lined up, if we know exactly what we're what we need to we need to do, uh, then that is certainly achievable. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next one is also in the um, surgical imaging space. Um, so this is a, a very exciting application where um, the system provides uh, 3D uh, imagery for the surgeon so that they're not only looking with one eye, but they can see with both eyes, which gives them some depth perception enabled in order that for them to see sort of how far away things are and also to, to move surgical tools with more finesse. And, this company's uh, goal is really to enhance capabilities of uh, robotic minimally invasive surgery with this imaging technology. And this system will provide uh, fewer complications in surgery with higher performance. The work that we did was related to very complex uh, optical design. So um, within every camera, you'll have a series of lenses um, that are put together to form an image at the back of the, the uh, of the lens at the image sensor. Uh, in this case, this is a stereo camera. So there's two parallel optical paths and that's shown here. And then there's an image sensor on the back and all of these components are mounted at the tip of, uh, of a laparoscope like this versus uh, this version that has the camera in the back. Uh, so this is called chip on tip technology. And the work that we did was related to designing the lens, uh, producing drawings and, and building uh, the lenses that are shown here for taking the picture. Okay, the next one, uh, this is a medical diagnostic application. Uh, this customer is um, challenging the boundaries of health testing with a one hour PCR COVID test and I'm sure by now everyone knows what PCR refers to. <laughs> um, a lot of our customers that were working in the general medical diagnostic space by like, quickly pivoted to uh, COVID testing last year, which was, was really exciting. Uh, this, this company was one of them. Uh, they had a general diagnostic technology for many different applications and really um, uh, uh, were able to pivot very quickly to COVID. Um, and at the time they lacked experience in uh, the illumination optics. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the COVID uh, testing methods use some sort of optics, either illumination and a camera or other 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 ways of detecting the presence of COVID nineteen. Um, so in this case, we did a uh, concept to final product design in three months. That was that was actually uh, possible because we used what's called off the shelf parts, parts that are catalog standard parts that were able to meet the requirement. question on this one. Dan, just from an interpersonal note, um, you know, with the global health uh, crisis with regards to COVID-19, um, I'm sure kind of back in, say, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, it, there's obviously a market opportunity. What did that look like for you guys, that pivot? Um, and I'm sure, you know, as a, a growing and amazing emerging startup, you need to be careful about how you scale too. Um, how hard of a pivot was that and how, uh, how much project readiness did you truly have uh, at that moment in time? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, what was interesting for me is because we work both in the, in the medical and surgery space as well as, as this uh, testing space, 
uh, hearing hearing that elective surgeries essentially were going to be paused for some period of time had me really concerned about business that we're doing in the medical space. Um, and then we had the excitement of many of our customers and new customers coming to us have some kind of a very, very fast paced COVID project. So it was really dynamic last year. Uh, what happened actually was that because we tend to work in earlier stage product development, uh, research and development projects at, at customers in the medical space continued on. In fact, uh, we were able to support those customers in, in new ways because their offices were shut down and we, we kept open uh, with reduced staff last year and were able to actually continue project work on behalf of the customers. So it was very you know, interesting dynamic. And I think that's you know, agility and, and flexibility is really the key there just to be able to adapt to you know, whatever the condition is. So um, it, was, uh, it was exciting. Thank you. Yeah, I see uh, Linda asked a question about uh, yes. percentage. Yeah. Do yeah, you if you want to take it? that, Dan, absolutely. It's uh, what percent of your customers are repeat customers versus new customers coming to you? Great question. Um, I don't have the actual the current data, but it's roughly uh, fifty to sixty percent, uh, typically. Okay, I think I'll move on to the next case study here. Um, so this is a company in medical diagnostics as well. Um, they're working on enabling preventative healthcare in the home. And so what this means is having a, a, a device that has advanced optics and artificial intelligence capability that could be used either in home or in other sort of uh, non-clinical non applications. This device uh, measured blood cell count. Um, and so it was a point of care blood analysis product. Uh, the, the customer came to us with a prototype using all kind of catalog parts, which was much larger uh, and didn't, didn't uh, cover as much of the cell sample in terms of uh, imaging field of view as they needed. So our work was around trying to find ways to uh, reduce the size as well as increase the field of view. And we developed a, a, a design option that actually achieved both um, using primarily off the shelf parts again and so because of that, we were able to work very quickly with the customer. Uh, this is an exciting project where we were essentially building um, new prototypes almost every week. Um, and they're in California, and we ship them uh, from Maine so that they could test them. And this product is now approved and, and on the market. OK, questions on this one? Good. So. Since we have enough time, I'm, I'm going to skip down to one other case study that I put towards the end here. Um, so this is the final case study. This is a, a um, it's called a multi-photon microscope system. Uh, and what that means is it uses a special combination of, of lasers and detectors to take pictures of, of uh, cells, um, cell samples, and produce um, but false color type images like shown down here. Um, and, and this customer is working on enabling advancements in life science and clinical diagnostics, um, enhancing disease diagnosis and treatment strategies using this technology. So this customer has a kind of a proprietary special uh, laser that's being built into a microscope. So microscope is, think of something that you're looking through your eyes at a, uh, a, a slide with a sample on it. Um, in this case, it's a digital microscope with lasers. Um, so there's no looking down something with your, with your eyes, but uh, the system scans lasers across the slide and ultimately takes a picture that looks something like this using a series of, of special uh, photo detectors. So the work that we did for them was um, a complete redesign of their optical path. So the series of lenses and mirrors that are used to scan the laser across the sample and produce the image. And the customers now built uh, several um, commercial versions of the product and, and are, um, are now starting to sell the product. Okay, any questions on this one? As it relates to, it looks like this is a, was a European uh, client. Yeah, uh, yeah. And just curious about the uh, gray optics, kind of the, the market size, uh, this clearly international 
what does that market look like, uh, both kind of domestically here in the U.S. as well as internationally? And um, if you feel comfortable, what, what's kind of the U.S.-based market competition for gray optics like? Yeah, this is it's an interesting um, area. So generally, we do product development for for optical devices, and um, there is a, there are a number of companies that are similar similar size and scope to us that offer different degrees of, of design only all the way through contract manufacturing. And so there's there's probably I don't know five to ten companies like that between the U.S. and 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 in Europe. Uh, there may be there may be that many in Europe. Um, in terms of our customer base, uh, majority, probably about 70% are US. And then we've got another cluster in, in Europe, United Kingdom, and then several other inter international customers, um, uh, India, uh, China. Um, we had an Australian company at one point. So because of the, the sort of virtual workspace that we have, we're able to support customers throughout the world. Um, and, uh, you know, that's through through COVID, it's allowed us to really kind of continue operating as normal um, with, with that, some of the travel restrictions. But um, being able to travel on site is is always helpful. Um, this summer, a bunch, uh, several members of our staff traveled down to customers in Boston and out in California, um, and so that really helps with collaboration. So, um, be, you know, because of the sort of virtual workspace, we're able to support customers across the globe. I think our our um, services are are really best aligned with customers in, in the United States and Europe. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Susan. I joined a little bit late. I apologies. Um, but I do have a question and maybe you did touch upon this earlier, but could you kind of talk about um, the benefits or the barriers perhaps, uh, Dan, that you experienced by being based in Maine? Sure. Yeah, I, I had a slide at the beginning about being in Maine, so we'll just look at that one. <laughs> Sorry, um, no, 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 it's fine. It's uh, so, yeah, you know, some of the benefits are really uh, shown here, just the biosciences cluster, uh, quality of life, proximity to Boston. Um, you know, if you think of companies that are out in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, like they're all within the, the distance from Portland to Boston, for example. So we have a nice corridor, biosciences corridor. Um, Challenges, I think it's, you know, we are, you know, outside of a metropolitan area. And I think that that's a, that's a, you know, a benefit and a challenge too, um, just because of the talent pool. So uh, one of the approaches that I, that we have, which I didn't touch on is that we do have some of our staff is per, are permanently remote. Um, and we have staff out in Colorado and uh, in Rochester, New York, and those are clusters, uh, optical uh, specific clusters as well. And we may consider opening offices in those locations to allow for um, a more, you know, sort of distributed, diverse, you know, team. Uh, Dan, if it's all right, and maybe yeah. kind of thematically staying with uh, Susan's main base question, sure. then, yeah. beyond uh, main bioscience, which is just an incredible organization um, and consortium, um, other resource partners that were particularly helpful for you yeah. and your team, for, you know, in the various phases of growth for Gray Optics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, early on, we, we had project work with Maine Technology Institute and uh, Maine Manufacturing uh, Partnership. And uh, those, those were great uh, to get us started. We did a market study and evaluated various opportunities. Um, as we continue to grow, we're, we're um, still holding on to those relationships and expanding into some of the other opportunities for, for funding in Maine with FAME. Um, and other organizations. So it's, I feel like it's a, it's a great uh, uh, community for, for business and entrepreneurship. And um, it's, you know, it's great to have these kind of networking events just to meet any, any other people that could, could collaborate with. And uh, we had a question through the chat here. Reiterate how customers come to us and how do we get customers? Yeah, great question. Um, in the early stages of, of, of the business, a lot of customers came in through referrals. And so I always like to tell a story when I was in college and professors like to explain how networking was very important and you're kind of like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but um, that was really critical uh, early and it still is, um, you know, uh, building a name, a brand and, and, a, and, and being known in our industry goes a long way. Um, and now we're focusing on expanding those channels through 
um, social media marketing websites, uh, trade journals, articles, and we've got some upcoming publications that'll be coming out, um, you know, to support spreading the word and, and that that's a sales channel, the funnel there. So again, I think it's, you know, many different channels and avenues, but um, referrals and sort of, you know, being known for doing good work and, and what we do is, is really important. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the, the final uh, section of the presentation. This is um, basically some takeaways and 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 uh, maybe some some tips that I could pass on um, in new product development. These are kind of the four common pitfalls that we observe um, that can really cause uh, schedule and cost issues and with projects. Um, as we talked about, identifying the user need or pain that the product's going to solve is not being understood um, can really be a, a major impediment um, or the requirements of how the device product needs to work being incomplete. Um, the usability of the product not understood or explored. How, how is somebody going to actually use this once we build it? Um, Technology is not fully de developed or de-risked, um, meaning that uh, there's amazing technologies coming out of universities, for example, and often they can be brought into a formal product development process too soon um, before some of the major technology risks are understood. Or another another area would be um, what was designed works great once, but when we try to take it into manufacturing, trying to do it over and over again, uh, it's not viable. And then finally, uh, supply chain not developed. The fourth area is, is risk assessment, and that really applies to kind of the entire process. So understanding technology risks, um, project risk, market risks, these kind of things. Um, so uh, some of the best practices. Uh, number one for requirements uh, and, and user needs, um, developing a document that is a working document early on, then it ultimately becomes kind of a final locked in document that describes what the product has to do and how it has to function uh, is really valuable. And uh, we believe that when we create these documents with our customers, it's, it's beyond the design, it's really one of the most valuable uh, pieces of information we can produce. Um, number two, um, getting to a functional prototype or a minimally viable product very early and getting in the hands of the end user is really critical because it helps you discover things that you might not have known uh, as you observe people using this. Um, thirdly, uh, using a design process. So there's several different techniques and methods. One I like to refer to for technology uh, risk assessment is the technology readiness level. So this refers to how advanced and mature technologies that are being applied. Um, it's really helpful to kind of gauge them at different stages. Um, there's a design for manufacture methodology, design for test, and design for supply chain. So keeping all these things in mind during the design process are really critical. And then finally, um, there are standards for risk assessment that could be used. There's also great frameworks for, for applying risk management from a, a, a development and technology perspective. Okay, so that's, that's the end of the slides here. And uh, happy to open it up for general questions and feedback. Well, just I'll jump in here really quickly as uh, folks distill thought. Um, really wonderful presentation, Dan. Uh, remarkable work and remarkable work uh, occurring in the state of Maine and kind of exporting this amazing uh, product, talent, and services around the world. So congratulations to you and your team. Thank you. Uh, you, you hinted. Or you said, you know, no, no uh, exit strategy um, right now. So hinting at maybe not really looking at a merger or acquisition. But what what does the you know the growth look like uh, in your vision for Gray Optics within you know say the next you know three to five years? Yeah, I I, I see us continuing to expand again along that strategic arc that I talked about and. I don't believe that it pertains to a particular you know, size of business, but we do want to continue adding in capabilities and, and uh, both from an engineering and a manufacturing and test and production perspective. And so that's going to come with um, a bigger building, 
um, you know, additional staff in, in different areas and really maturing and kind of um, uh, professionalizing the business. So, and that part's really exciting, I think, for everybody here is to, to kind of go along that growth path. And maybe selfishly, just to tease that out <laughs> a little bit, you know, yeah. talking about a going to have like a facility and a kind of a, a a, a, technolo a technological precision manufacturing facility, um, significant capital expenditures, Blue Sky Vision, you know, what does that facility look like uh, if we were to kind of take a, take a tour in your mind, if you will? Yeah, what, actually, um, one of the things wise, I didn't mention. Equipment-wise, yeah. size-wise, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part, part of that, it's part of the kind of founding story, actually, that I didn't mention is um, finding the right space is one of the, one of the most challenging aspects of starting a business. Um, great sort of co-working opportunities around here. Great, beautiful, um, you know, mill buildings that you could set up an office in, but there aren't great uh, R&D and tech, uh, 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 you know, buildings in, in this area, I found, unlike, you know, Boston, where they're, they're everywhere. So, um, you know, I think we're looking at rehabbing some, like a, 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 a warehouse type of facility or, you know, something of that nature that um, is set up uh, with kind of modern lab and manufacturing capabilities, um, possibly clean room, you know, office space. Um, there's a great advantage to kind of separating engineering and production. So you could also kind of think of like a two building campus, um, you know, those, those kind of things I think would be really exciting to see. Great, thank you. Yeah. Dan, um, I was just wondering, when you talked about your best practices, could you just um, describe, there's probably no typical, but what the timeline looks like from when you're contacted by um, a client to develop a product? Is there a typical amount of time? I know you save time by using off-the-shelf products at times, but could you just yeah, talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. It, it does really depend on, on the maturity of the technology and the type of product, uh, the complexity. So um, I think the shortest, the shortest timeline, say for, especially for non-regulated device, it doesn't need to go through FDA approval. You know, a, a year type of product development cycle could be achievable um, from start to finish. And you're, you know, you're into sort of the you know, pre-sale, pre-production phase at that point. Um, whereas medical devices will, will be multi-year, uh, multi-million dollar sort of effort, most likely. Um, and so, really the sort of the, the reason that I talk about these pitfalls in product development is, is to try to streamline things, um, not do things too soon, not go down the wrong path. Um, when you're working in medical devices, going back to the slide, you actually don't wanna get into a formal design process too early either, because once you're in there, you have a lot of controls around documentation and approvals that need to be made every time there's a revision or a new version. So getting to that you know, MVP prototype outside of any kind of formalization that you kind of check all the, the risk boxes is really critical, we found. So um, that's where you know, something that, um, that might take you know, three to five years using a haphazard approach could, could, could be done a lot quicker um, by doing you know, these steps. Great, any other questions? Well, Dan, just wanna say thank you so much again, uh, such a wonderful presentation. Um, and for folks uh, either right now or folks listening at home at a later date, uh, thank you again. Uh, Dan's contact information uh, was in the presentation as well as uh, dropped uh, into the chat feature here with regards to uh, the uh, link uh, to Gray Optics. Uh, Sabrina, you want to send us away? Absolutely. Dan, thank you again so much for joining us um, and helping to shape the ecosystem that is here in Maine for entrepreneurship and innovation. Oh, so, thank to you. Those, so to those who are watching, um, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month on Thursday, September 9th with our next speaker, Defendify, streamlining cybersecurity across people, processes, and technology. More information on that tech talk will be forthcoming, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.